Hey, good morning, everybody. Come on in and find a place to stand. Yeah, yeah. Hey, PK, Kevin, good to see you guys. I got a scripture for you this morning out of the uh, book of Psalms, the 86th chapter, and this is out of the Passion Translation. It says, God, there is no one like you. There is no other God as famous as you. You outshine all the others, and your miracles make it easy to know you. Lord Almighty, you are the one who created all the nations. Look at them. They're all on their way. Yes, the day will come when they will worship you and put your glory on display. You are the one and only God. What miracles, what wonders, what greatness belongs to you. Amen. Let's come to a time of just worshiping his greatness. There's going to come a time every nation every voice, every person is going to worship the Lord. And so, you know what? You might as well just get in the groove. You might as well just get practiced up. You might as well just start to enter in and declare His beauty and declare His majesty and declare His glory because that's who He is. And he manifests that inside of our lives. He is such a loving God. So take time in worship today. Take time. Just look around right now. Just look around. See your neighbor so you don't, you're not distracted during worship. You can see who's, who's in front of you, who's in back of you. So you can say, ooh, that wonderful voice, where's that coming from? Oh, I know that's brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. So you're not distracted during worship today. And just enter in to all he has for you. Amen. again.
have come to give you highest praise, highest praise. We have come to love you in this place. We have come to give you highest praise, highest praise. We have come to love you in this place. Yeah. Cry out to, we cry out to, we cry out. 
love you, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. We thank you, God. We thank you, are so Lord. great. Take it with you. So marvelous he is. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I just feel the Lord. Because he said there would be joy in his house. Yes. That he would give joy for those that are mourning. That he would be close to the brokenhearted. That he, on that day, would be their deliverance. That he would be their guiding light. Holy Spirit. <laughs> we just invite you here. You're so amazing. What joy you bring to break off the chains of heaviness off our lives. That everything seems so small compared to you. Oh, Holy Spirit, just come just invite him all over the room. Engage with him. He's doing something in your life. We welcome you. We welcome you today. Come have your way. Because we came here for you. We didn't come for the worship team. We didn't come for the preaching. We came here for you, God. We came here for you, God. Yeah. None is worthy. our praise today you're so worthy of our love today we pour it out on you pour it out on you It's your breath. 
Anything I've tasted, I wanna know. 
Cause your love is so much sweeter than anything I've tasted. I want to know your heart. I want to know your heart. Pull me a little closer and take me a little deeper. presence, Lord. We rest in your goodness. We thank you, Lord, for your heart. Thank you, Lord. If we don't understand your heart, we get confused. And uh, I just I just know, you guys, there's confusion on the land. There's confusion in the air. But if we discern the heart of God, there's, there's peace and there's order. And we encourage each other in this way as the body of Christ. There's, a, there's an influence of heaven that keeps us in a good place, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a realm of sanity in the midst of uh, confusion and insanity. You know, when Jesus came into the world, he didn't come to make our life here easier. He came to call us to the kingdom. There's two kingdoms. If we don't understand that and know his heart, that he's called us to this other realm. And that's why worship is so powerful. You know, we just got to get in that place. And we feel like we're, we're not just under the, the chaos of this world, but we're able to touch heaven. Heaven comes about us and we feel different. It, it's, it's, it is different. It's the, it's the contrast of of the earthy domain and the kingdom of God. Ha. Huh. And here we are. And he's drawn us to this place. See, if we don't understand, we'll be confused. We'll feel disoriented. Disillusion. But we got to understand what he's called us to. I just speak that peace to each and every one of you. His kingdom is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Amen. It's a spiritual realm. It's a domain where there is no question who's in charge and what's been established for us. And it, it uh, is an influence to all that is around us. Jesus came into our world. He stepped on this ground. He walked among us. He was like us. He became like us. He surrendered his right to be God and walked in our shoes in order to break that stuff off of us and bring us into a greater fullness. Amen? Amen. That's, that's just good perspective for us here on April 18th. I almost said 19, 2021. That's just good perspective for us. Father, we pray that you would secure us and establish us in our kingdom identity. Lord, that you would secure and establish us in the realm of your, your uh, dominion. Father, we thank you for strengthening us. We're, we're still in the world, but we're not of the world. Father, strengthen us, each one. I pray, Father, for those who are 
struggling today. And Lord, you would meet us in our weakness. We have feet of clay. But God, you've given us your Holy Spirit. Rise up, Holy Spirit. Quicken us this day. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for healing our bodies. Thank you for touching our minds. We confess that we have the mind of Christ. Confusion, we command you to go in Jesus' name. Heaviness, you go in Jesus' name. Fear, be gone in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Huh. Some of you, some of you are facing uncertainty, and it's like a, it's like a, a torment against you. It's exhausting. Amen the uncertainty, but there's a certainty in the kingdom that he wants you to just stand in, even if you don't know the outcome. Lord, we just position ourselves in you, Lord, in the certainty of your care for us, in the certainty of your provision for us. Father, we, we break the power of this, this uh, uncertainty off of us in Jesus' name, because we know that you are good and that, Lord, you, you're our shepherd and you care for us. Amen. 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 Any prayer needs this morning, just shoot, shoot a hand up, please. If you just come in and just wanted to, somebody pray for you, touch with God. Amen. Let's pray for Larry. Let's, let's pray for Jeannie at the back there. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I want to pray for Malin, Malin, whose back has been hurt. Thank you, Jesus, for ministry of the Holy Spirit and the ministry of the body of Christ. As kingdom people, Lord, there's a release of heaven through us. We thank you, Lord, for the power of God just flowing in this place, ministering life, Lord, reaching those who are in need right here. Lord, even those who are in need in some other place, there is no distance in the Spirit. Father, we thank you for ministry of life, of health and of well-being, of provision in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We thank you for Malin, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you're meeting him right in this moment. Holy Spirit, just cause his, that inflammation in his back to subside, and Lord, that he would uh, find strength and healing, strength and healing in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Let this be a turnaround day for him in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for the confidence we have to approach the throne of grace, to pray and know that our prayers are heard and answered in Christ. And we ask in that mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen and amen. Praise God. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. You may be seated. Hallelujah. We just want to welcome everyone here this morning. So kind of while we're postured in this place of prayer, uh, I had a word that this morning. I was preparing for my Sunday school message. I have this bad habit of waiting till the last minute to prepare for it, but um, I'm sitting on our little table behind our couch this morning preparing for my Sunday school message, and at the same time I'm watching TV, which is another terrible habit I have, uh, but uh, <laughs> I'm watching TV and it's uh, Karate Kid, and if you're a 90s kid, we've, we've all seen it. So um, I'm watching Karate Kid, and I'm distracted, and I keep looking up, and I'm distracted, and I, I hear the Holy Spirit say, just pause, pause. And uh, so I, okay, all right, Lord, I get it. I pause, and I begin to really dive deep into the Word of God, look at what I'm going to prepare for, for today's message in Sunday school, and my message I like stood up after I get done writing all my notes and I literally preach this message out in front of my TV while my TV's paused. And I'm like going, where'd that come from? But the funny part is, I thought it was about preparing this message. 
it's kind of ironic. I finished preparing this message. I'm really proud of myself, high and mighty, and I push play because I'm like, I want to watch the rest of Karate Kid. And I'm watching, and the Lord wanted me to watch Karate Kid this morning. He begins to speak to my heart about his body, his church, right now in this season, collectively. And it's going through these scenes where Danielson is training with Miyagi, but Danielson is very frustrated because he doesn't realize he's in training. Miyagi's got in painting a fence and sanding down on the deck and painting his house. And it's day after day after day that Miyagi's got him tirelessly, seemingly slaving away at all of his duties that really Miyagi should be taking care of himself. And in his frustration, Danielson all of a sudden gets mad at Miyagi at the end of his hard day of work. And he says, I'm, I'm over here doing all your work and you're not doing anything for me. You're not doing anything for me. I'm tired and I'm suffering. Miyagi looks at him and says, show me sand the deck. Show me wax the car. I don't know the terms that well. Maybe I should learn Karate Kid a little better. If <laughs> Wax on, wax off. Thank you, Angela. <laughs> wax on, wax off. And he's walking through all these motions that for the past four days he thought were just sort of like him earning Miyagi's respect. But the entire time, Miyagi's training him in karate. He's showing him how to block all the enemy's attacks. Sometimes we have the wrong perspective on what the Lord is doing in our lives. Sometimes he's like Miyagi. He's saying, you've got to walk through this stuff. You have to go through this because I've got a lesson for you at the end of it. I'm here today to tell you the same thing the Lord told me this morning. Keep walking. Keep walking. Sometimes you're not going to get it. Sometimes you're going to be confused. If you know my story, I know Rich does, and there's many people in this body that know my story. I had to walk through it. And there were seasons that I was ready to give up. But as I walked through that, the Lord strengthened me. He strengthened me, walked me through those things with Him. And He prepared me for what was ahead. So I believe that's a season that the Lord is walking us through right now, church. Let's give the Lord a praise clap this morning. You know? Amen. Stay with it. There should be a moment. You know, we had John give a just an unction to us. James shared his heart of what the Lord revealed to him. And um, the Lord also spoke to me about an individual, and I don't even know who this person is, but is there a Cassandra in the crowd today? Cassandra? First name or middle name, Cassandra? No? Okay. All right, then. All right. Thank you, Pastor. <laughs> is Cassandra, maybe she's going to be one. So does anyone here know someone whose name is Cassandra? Just lift up your hand because these lights are so bright. They make me nice and tan. All right, so if Cassandra, if you're listening online, uh, as I was praying this morning. Yeah. Tommy's co-worker is named Cassandra. Okay. So I'm going to give this word, and, even that, and I'll, I'll share this with you, brother. Thank you. So as I was praying this morning, I saw Cassandra reaching out. Uh, to the Lord, and the word to her was that the Lord hears and sees all and is moving on her behalf, and she needs to start to declare that the Lord is moving on her behalf, and so there's a, 
there's a spirit that's working against her to discourage her. And so she needs to rise up and say, the Lord is working on my behalf. And he gave me this portion of scripture out of Isaiah 64, verse number four. And I'm going to read it out of the Passion Translation. These amazing things, is talking about the Lord, these amazing things had never been heard of before. You did things never dreamed of. No one perceived your greatness. No eye has ever seen a God like you who intervenes for those who wait and long for you. So, Lord, I just pray if Cassandra's online, and even as we share this with Tommy for his coworker, Cassandra, Father, I just pray I come against that spirit that has come to discourage her because she has great things in store for her life because, God, you are great, and, God, you are always in constant intervention for those that wait upon you. And we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Did you catch that? For those who wait, wait. <laughs> the W word. All right. I'm going to ask Ann to come up. Ann, why don't you come up? She has a testimony she wants to share with us real quick. Well, we're just having church this morning. Amen. The Lord's good. So I've been coming here for a year and five months now. Um, my life has changed dramatically. I've told my story. Um, they're doing like a documentary in Canyon City. It should be airing here pretty soon. Um, I'm going to go talk to um, this lady at Pueblo Department of Public Health and Environment to tell my story. And we're just getting the um, recovery, pure stuff out there. Um, I finished all my classes. I had to do 25 more hours. That was kind of a touchy thing that you have to do. So I went to Springs Friday, and I talked to the guy in charge at Embark, and he just enrolled me in a $1,000 class for free to get me the rest of the hours and get some more training. So um, maybe by July, I should be state certified as a peer recovery coach. <laughs> Amen. There's a scripture in Galatians that says, the comfort you receive from him, give it to one another. Amen. That's the way kingdom works, right? All right, we're going to dedicate a baby this morning. All right, little Jet. Chris, Shauna, you guys come on up. Family, if you guys want to come up as well, come on up and... What a privilege it is to, you know, as, as the body of Christ, just to do life together. You know, we're, we're there at the beginning, we're there at the end. <laughs> and all the way through the middle, weddings, baby dedications. How are you guys doing? <laughs> what a handsome set of boys you guys got. Absolutely. I had... Uh, just had some things in my heart for you as we come to this, this moment for little Jet. You know, parenting's not easy. I think we can all attest to that. We get to look in the mirror at ourselves and think, well, I still need some parenting myself. <laughs> Father. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he is a great father. And because of his presence in our lives, we can intentionally parent in partnership with him. Realize that when we miss the mark, that he's there. And, you know, it's, it's our heart to partner with him that really gives the grace for an overall, all well-rounded influence from heaven in the lives of, of these precious children that he entrusts into our care. Uh, the demands of parenting are, are pretty intense at times. But the rewards are great. Galatians 6, 9 says, and let, not, and let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Isaiah 40, 31 says, but those who wait for the Lord, we add that word here, will renew their strength and they will mount up with wings as eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. 
you know, when we're waiting, we realize the story isn't over, that it's not done. Sometimes life puts us in a place where we feel like we've just come to that dead end. It's, it's over. The waiting on the Lord get, helps us get past that. And you have all, all sorts of encounters with that when you're, when you're parenting and raising a family because you come to the end of yourself. But God's there when we come to the end of ourselves. Luke 18 says, One day some parents brought their little children to Jesus so that he could touch and bless them. But when the disciples saw this, they scolded the parents for bothering him. Then Jesus called for the children and said to the disciples, Let the children come to me. Don't stop them, for the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. I tell you the truth, anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. Interesting how Jesus spoke up for the parents when these guys were kind of bringing the clamp down on him. And, and I want you guys to know that God's favor is with you, and he's speaking up for you before the Father as our, as our intercessor and for these guys and all that faces us in our, in our journey. Amen. All right, Jet. You ready, buddy? <laughs> Praise God. Amen. I like the vest. I wished I had one of those. <laughs> Thank you, Father. Father, just as Jesus laid his hands on the children and blessed them, Father, I lay my hands upon Jet and I bless him. I pray that, Lord, the, richness, the riches of your grace would rest upon him. Lord, that you would be the dominant influence over everything pertaining to his life as the years roll on. Father, that you keep him, that you protect him, that you, Lord, would guide him. Lord, that you would tend to his heart and that, Lord, he would find you personally, not with his mom's faith, not with his dad's faith, but with his own personal faith, genuine, rich, and deep. I pray that in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray that you would rise and confound his enemies and bring their works to naught. I speak blessings over him. I speak blessings over this family because he's not growing up all alone. The Lord, he's growing up in the context of, of these uh, brothers. <laughs> and Chris and Shauna, Kim, and the rest of the family. Father, I pray that your grace and strength would be upon them, that, God, you would give them all that they need. Father, we stand with them. We pray that, God, you would be all that they need and that you would breathe upon them even this day a wind of refreshing, the, the strength of the Lord, the mounting up with wings as of eagles, Lord, that they would run, and that, Lord, they would not become weary. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Bless you, buddy. Amen. Chris, can I give a prophetic word for his brothers? Half the ridge. Can I give a prophetic yes. word for his brothers? Hey, yes. your son. I know they have a lot of passion, but I heard the Lord say, those are the sons of thunder. And that they were the ones who were like, Jesus, those people don't even know who you are. Call down fire on them and declare your name, like devour whole cities. But they were the first ones who believed in the supernatural power of Jesus when he walked on, his earth, on this earth, because no other disciples quite put it together. And James is one who was so fond of the word and that your sons are going to grow up strong in the Lord, that their lives are going to be billboards for the gospel. And their rambunctiousness, the Lord is like, I gave them like that because they're going to do amazing things for my kingdom. So I bless your children. Yes. Bless you guys. Yes. 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 All right. All right. We're going to take up an offering. Thank you, ushers. Amen. Lord, we thank you for the, yeah. just the, uh, the privilege to, to give and to partner with you, Lord, 
in our finances. We pray the Lord you bless this offering, bless this ministry. Father, that you bless the gift and the giver as well in Jesus' name. And that, Lord, you would be glorified in every act. Father, we commit this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. When darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know No, I won't be shaken I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your Welcome to the Life Church, a caring and Christ centered church. If this is your first time joining us, please fill out a visitor's card located in the seat pocket right in front of you. Are you in need of prayer or would you like to pray on someone's behalf? If so, join us for our intercessory prayer every Thursday at 10 a.m. at the TLC offices. Also, be sure to join us for the Pueblo Incense House of Prayer every Monday, Tuesday, and Saturday at 6 p.m. here at the church. Parents and youth of TLC, don't forget we've started our brand new youth ministry called Rooted and we'll be meeting every Wednesday night at 6 p.m. at the youth room below the TLC offices. For more information, please see James or Michaela Harvey. There's no one else like you. How about being the best you you could be? You know, what I learned is if some people don't like you, that's called life. Not everyone's going to like you. Jesus said, love your enemies, so you have to have some. But if everyone doesn't like you, that has nothing to do with the people. It has to do with you. It has to do with something's wrong in the lens of your life. We have to realize that Jesus gave us a new name. That we were born in the image and likeness of God. It's about you forgiving because you were forgiven. And I just want to say to you today, I don't care what's been done to you. You are not doing you a favor by not forgiving them. 
We do everything to reduce people in the name of humility. And yet I propose that Jesus is trying to unveil us. You know you were born to be amazing. Whatever he created, you're created above. Humility isn't thinking less of yourself. It's just thinking of yourself less. If you don't want to come into your identity for your sake, you need to do it for everyone who's supposed to be following you. Lord, we just pray that you would give us the gift of distinguishing of spirits <laughs> so that we could actually honor people and favor people whom you favor. And we can actually be in this place where we connect the generations, break the curses, and realize that you're pouring your spirit out on everybody. Not just the people who are beautiful and handsome and capable, but you're also pouring out on people who are older, who are maybe the best years of their physical life are past, but yet they carry a great grace. Lord, may we come to this place in the kingdom where all generations, both genders, and all occupations are honored in the kingdom. And be sure to join us for our equipping group. We'll be meeting every Wednesday at 6 p.m. here at the church. For more information, please see your news sheet. <laughs> Kids, you are now free to go to Sunday school. <laughs> now, please join me in welcoming Josh Floyd as he comes to bring the word. Good morning. Hey, let's pray. Father, would you enlighten our eyes this morning to see your son? We want to encounter you face to face. We want to know your heart. We open our hearts to you withholding nothing, nothing hidden in sincerity. Father, grace me to speak well of you. Grace me to not say anything that's blasphemy or stupid. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll do my best to not do that. So I'm going to talk about the heart of worship today. I made like 25 slides or something like that. I'll try to blitz through them. So sorry about that. I'm a teacher, so slides are like my love language. Zach always says notes are his love language. Slides are mine. Um, would you open up to John 4? Verse 23 for me. If you don't have a Bible, that's fine. I used my phone today. And we can just read this together if you'd like. You, and we're going to come back to this toward the end of this message so you can mark this in your Bible. Stick a finger in it. Put a bookmark on it. It says, But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. Everybody say worshipers. What I love about this is it doesn't say he's seeking worship. It says he's seeking worshipers. He's not one of those egotistical power maniacs that just needs our worship to thrive. He's self-sustaining already. He doesn't need any of us, but he wants you. He wants your heart. He wants, he's looking for worshipers. And it's actually like selflessness of God for him to want you to be a worshiper, because that's the greatest thing you could ever be. So we're going to talk about that in a little bit. I want to read something out of Malachi chapter 1. I didn't make a slide for this. Um, this is kind of the Lord rebuking some people, so please don't take it that way for yourself. I think this is just kind of an eternal, maybe not eternal because we'll be in heaven for eternity, but a long-lasting message to those that minister to God. Malachi 1 and verse 6, A son honors his father and a servant his master. Then if I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my respect? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? You are presenting defiled food upon my altar. But you say, how have we defiled you? In that you say, the table of the Lord is to be despised. But when you present the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you present the lame and sick, is it not evil? Why not offer it to your governor? Would he be pleased with you? Or would he receive you kindly, says the Lord of hosts? But now will you not entreat God's favor, that he may be gracious to us? With such an offering on your part, will he receive any of you kindly, says the Lord of hosts? Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the gates. 
that you might not uselessly kindle fire on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering for you. For from the rising of the sun, even to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense is going to be offered to my name. And a grain offering that is pure, for my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. And I'm going to stop there just to kind of explain. He's, he's dealing with these priests that are not taking their service seriously. They're not taking their worship, their act of worship to him seriously. And they're bringing lame and blind animals to offer on his altar, which there's plenty of scriptures all throughout the Old Testament talking about how that's not allowed. So it's really his mercy that they're not dead yet, just to be honest. I want to go to, just to acknowledge this, I think how it applies for our lives. You know, James was talking about Mr. Miyagi and Daniel son, I think that's a perfect picture of our ministry to God. You know, he's painting his house. He's ministering. He's like dealing with his house. And in the Old Testament, God lived in a physical house, in a temple. But now he lives in you. So when Daniel son's painting the fence and painting the house, he's actually ministering to the people of God. And in that ministry to God... He's being qualified to minister to Jesus. See, his, his act of service, his act of worship to people is actually what opens intimacy with God. See, Daniel didn't really know Miyagi until after he did all his chores. And then he got to have some face-to-face interaction. So I think those two things go hand in hand. It's better for us not to offer anything to God than to give him less than our best. When we come to the Lord, we should be willing to give it all and do it in joy and faith. We give in faith to please him, for it is impossible to please God without faith. And we know that from Hebrews chapter 11. In Ezekiel 44, there is a description of how God wants to be worshipped. And it's an Old Testament description. So it's, it's kind of hard to deal with. I would recommend that you kind of uh, read through this on your own and ask the Lord to shine the light on it for you. I'm not going to read through it just because I don't want to take up the time. But basically, he's talking about how priests minister to God, but they also minister to people. That they have this inner court ministry where they're going to, to Jesus, to the presence And they're ministering to the presence of God, offering sacrifices. What's really cool is they even had different clothes for each ministry. They would put on linen garments when they were ministering to God. And they would put on wool garments when they were ministering to the people. And the whole reason was because the linen garments were cool. They were kind of like this shirt. Like, yeah, I know I'm really cool in this shirt. But I mean, literally, like they didn't sweat a whole lot when they were in linen garments. And if they did sweat, they'd probably die. So the whole point of it was God was saying, I don't want you to minister to me out of human striving. I don't want you to sweat when you're ministering to me. I want it to come from a place of peace, uh, a human being instead of a human doing when you minister to me. But then when we turn around and leave the presence of God and minister to the people, we put on wool garments. And wool makes you sweat a lot. So there's this duality. And our service to God is supposed to be effortless. But when we serve people, it's supposed to be a lot of effort. We're supposed to sweat. It's supposed to be some work. And that's the way God's ordained it. So there's, again, these people in Ezekiel 44, these Levites who didn't take their ministry seriously. And they were the ones who were the high priests. So they got the privilege of ministering to God. And the other priests did everything else, like cleaning the toilets, vacuuming the carpets, and, uh, you know, dealing with the deliverance ministry because they didn't want to, the high priest didn't want to deal with the crazy people, you know what I'm saying? And uh, they, they got to deal with all the things that the high priest didn't want to deal with. But the high priest didn't take it seriously. And they, they kind of put their noses up. In Ezekiel 44, it talks about them putting their noses up at certain types of temple ministry. So God... Let me just read this. We're called to be priests that minister to the Lord and also minister to people. We come before him and offer sacrifices, and we leave to teach, train, and exhort his people. Both activities qualify you for the other. 
while the main priests went out and served idols, these are the ones that turned their nose, there were these groups of priests called the sons of Zadok. God make us like the sons of Zadok that stayed faithful in the mundane activities. They cleaned the toilets. They dealt with people. And because of their faithfulness to the mundane, the Lord flipped the scripts. And he gave them the right to minister to God, stripping it from those that squandered the privilege. And this is the same thing he did with Satan, actually. Satan squandered the privilege of ministering to God, so he took that right away from him and gave it to us. He literally created us so that we would have that inner court ministry. And, but what's cool is with the sons of Zadok, they weren't important. They were not high-ranking Levites. They were the guys that cleaned the toilets. But by serving others in those mundane things, we become qualified to minister to God in a deeper way. We get to go into the inner courts. I just feel his presence. This then fills us and anoints us with glory to turn around and minister to those who are outside of the courts. So it's actually your service to his house, the mundane things. And again, his house is not a physical building. His house is the people. His presence is housed in the people that you see. And your ministry to those people outside is actually what qualifies you to minister to a deeper place of God's heart. So don't put those things aside. Let's go back to John 4.23. An hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth for such people, the Father, to be his worshipers. The Father is looking for worshipers. He's looking for us. He's a loving God who desires us. In fact, he is love, and love wants the best for you, which is to be a worshiper. David was a worshiper, and he was chosen to be king before he did anything important. (laughs) God saw this 15-year-old kid singing and playing guitar in front of a congregation of sheep and called him a man after his own heart. When everyone else was following a list, of set, a list of rules and laws, David found the heart of God. And because of that, God chose to call Jesus son of David. <laughs> this 15-year-old kid probably can't sing a lick. That's why the only things that will listen to him are sheep. He probably knows like three chords on the guitar, or the lyre is what it was back then. And he probably wasn't any good. But he found God's heart. There are all these rules, laws, things you're supposed to do. And David did all that stuff. But as the youngest sibling, that when Samuel comes to anoint him as king, his dad doesn't even grab him. That's how insignificant this kid is. His dad's like, oh, it couldn't be David. It's got to be one of my other sons. They're all, he's kind of a slouch. You don't want to see him. All he does is jump around in the hills and sing songs. He's horrible at it. He's an embarrassment to the family. Every time we go to the temple, he's that guy that jumps and dances around and sings super loud and annoys everybody else. We get kicked out every week. But that's the guy who God said he's a man after his own heart. And then he sat himself, Jesus, on his throne, on a 15-year-old kid's throne. <laughs> I just think that's really significant. God's looking for worshipers, and David was a worshiper. Because the absolute greatest thing you could ever do, the greatest thing you could ever do is be a worshiper of Jesus. He knows this is the best because as we see him, we become like him. We're transformed according to our exposure to the glory and presence of God, which is the face of Jesus. It is truth that you become like what you trust and what you look at. The things that you trust and the things that you look at are what you become like. Psalm 115, I messed some things up with my slides, so I don't have a slide for you to read, but I'm going to read Psalm 115 for you. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory because of your loving kindness, because of your truth. Why should the nation say, where now is their God? But our God is in the heavens. 
He does whatever he pleases. <laughs> I love that scripture when people are like, well, where is it in the Bible that people are supposed to roll on the floor and laugh their heads off? It's, it's right there. <laughs> but our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. <laughs> That's what I always tell people. It's Psalm 115. It's in there. Promise. When people are like, well, the Brownsville revival, and they're all barking like dogs and clucking like chickens. Where is that in the Bible? Psalm 115. He sits in the heavens. He does what he pleases. Anyway, little side note. Verse 4, their idols are silver and gold, the works, the work of man's hands. They have mouths, but they cannot speak. They have eyes, but can't see. Ears, but can't hear. Noses, but can't smell. Hands, but can't feel. Feet, but can't walk. And cannot make a sound with their throat. Those who make them, look at this, will become like them. Everyone who trusts in them. That would suck for that to be the description of your life. <laughs> like all those things, feet but you can't walk, like, oh, good luck. Those who make them will become like him. Everyone who trusts in them. Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. House of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. So what you trust, you become like. What you make, you become like. 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. And it's also true that as we see him, we become like him. That's in 2 Corinthians 3.18. We all with unfailed face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. Okay, so I want to talk about some thanksgiving and praise. And um, I want to just kind of talk about those concepts. Thanksgiving and praise are kind of the same thing. Like, a song could be thanksgiving, it could also be praise. A dance could be thanksgiving, it could also be praise. Thing, those types of things, it can go either way. But the main way that I like to look at it is thanksgiving responds to his works, and praise responds to his ways. Like, when we talked about Moses and the Israelites, they said that Moses knew his ways. The Israelites knew his works. So the Israelites saw what he did. Moses knew who he was. So when we give thanks... Say somebody gets healed, we can thank God for that healing when we praise him as the healer. We thank him for healing, we praise him as the healer. So they go hand in hand. As you can easily tell, thanksgiving can lead you into praise almost immediately. And there's seven Hebrew words for praise. Pastor Rich gave us a little teaser on that a couple weeks ago. And some of them have to do with thanksgiving, some of them have to do with praise. So there, it's kind of a little bit of both. So I don't want to give you a this is what it is. Don't, don't die on that hill. Um, praise is our strength. This is what's really fun. Praise is our strength. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here, but if you look in Psalm 8, it's, it says, out of the mouth of the babes and inf infants, you have perfected praise. But when Jesus quoted that scripture in Matthew 21, when all the babies were calling him the Messiah, all the kids were calling him the Messiah and jumping off the stage and running back. He's, Hosanna, he's the Messiah. And you know it was like that. And they're like, do you hear what they're saying? And he goes, yeah, haven't you read? Out of the mouth and babes and infants, you have ordained strength. He didn't say perfected praise. He said ordained strength. So either Jesus forgot or he's giving us an insight. I think as the word of God, he is the logos. It's hard for him to misquote scripture considering that he is the word. So I think he's giving us an insight that actually perfected praise is the strength of the church. It, it actually is where our strength comes from. So there's seven Hebrew words for praise. I'm going to blitz through these. First one is halal. It's the primary Hebrew root word for praise. That's where hallelujah comes from, and it means to be clear to praise, to shine, to boast, to show, to rave, celebrate, to be clamorously foolish. That's fun. The next one is yada. And as I'm going through these, I want you to look at these as seven options for you to pick from when you're praising God. Okay? So these are seven ways that you could and can praise God. And you should do that. If you know that you can, you should do it. The next one is yada. 
Pastor Rich talked about this one, the extended hand, to throw out the hand, to worship with extended hands, to lift the hands. It can infer a surrendering of things to the Lord. And according to the lexicon, the opposite of this is to bemoan or to wring your hands. Like, oh no. So Pastor Rich kind of talked about throwing things up to God. It really is a surrender. You put your hands up and you're surrendering it, whatever it is that you're wringing your hands about. It's a really cool way to praise God. We should all try it. Um, The next one is toda, which is similar to yada, their partner words. It's an extension of the hand in adoration of our acceptance, but it actually infers thanking God in advance. So for things not yet received as well as already at hand. So that could be like thanking God before you've seen the results Like one of the ways that I've been taught to pray for healing, I did it this morning when we were praying for Larry, is I thanked God for the healing. Even though he wasn't healed, I said, Father, I thank you for a brand new neck in the name of Jesus. You know, those those ways of thanking God in advance activates your faith and brings you into a place of praise of who he is, even though the facts don't count, like the facts don't match up with the truth. Sometimes that happens, but when we lean into the truth, the facts submit. Okay, uh, the next one is Shabak. This is a fun one, to shout, to address in a loud tone, to command, to triumph. The word triumph is really cool. It was actually uh, a processional thing. Like when it talks about the triumphant procession, Jesus leads us in triumph. It's talking about when there's two kingdoms at war, The one that loses gets stripped naked and dragged behind the chariot of the winner through his own city. So when God's leading us through triumphant procession, (laughs) who's naked behind the chariot? So sometimes when when the enemy speaks things to you, all you need to remember is that guy's naked being drugged behind the chariot that me and Jesus are in. And sometimes that's all it takes, right? So that can be the way that you can shabak. You can be like, hey, yeah, you know? I do that a lot. You probably noticed. <laughs> no. I'm, so me and Jay, sorry, story time. Me and Jay one time when I was in college went to this men's conference. And, and Corey Russell was the speaker. It was awesome. It was at Glen Erie, which is a great place. And um, I, Jay and I hadn't really gone anywhere together, so I just kind of gave him this warning. I was like, hey, Jay, I'm sorry if I'm a little out there with the worship thing. And he was like, brother, I know. <laughs> I know. Um, I, I was on this worship team twice, actually. So if you've been in this church as long as I have or longer, then you remember there was like a short season where I was a singer on the worship team. And then I wasn't <laughs> for a period of time. But that's because when I was on the stage, I was like the two kids this morning during the baby dedication. So I'm just saying, like, I've been, I've been ridiculed, I've been made fun of, and that's okay with me. There was a, Zach and I went up to this prayer meeting a few months back, Desiree was there too, Chelsea, and I was really excited to meet this guy that runs it, because he was like the guy that ran the Bible school Zach went to, I'd heard a bunch of things about him, I knew about him, and I go up and meet him, and the first thing I do is knock his coffee over. <laughs> I'm like, dang it, Lord. And uh, it's, I make a huge mess, and I'm all apologetic, whatever. It's embarrassing. That's one of my absolute worst fears is spilling drinks, which I think I've shared before. So it was just good for me. It was a good experience that I had to work through, like daniel son. And then at the end of the service, there's this cool guy named Frank and his wife Elizabeth. And he's like, oh, I'm, I really like to dance during worship, but my knee hurts. So we're praying for his knee. We get up from praying for his knee. And he looks at me and he says, you know, Joshua always walked in triumph. And I fell out, hit the bench, rolling on the floor, <laughs> laughing hysterically. And, and I hear the pastor, who I was really excited to meet, his little boy, he's like sitting behind me like 10 minutes later, and he goes, why doesn't he just get up already? <laughs> and his mom says, he's had a tough month. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what I skipped over is during that worship service, 
he was like, hey, I feel like the Lord wants us to give him something. You know, that, that yada, give him something, extending the hand. And I asked the Lord, what do you want me to give you? He said, I want your dignity and your decency. And I was like, is that why you made me spill that guy's coffee? <laughs> and I was like, okay, Lord, I give you my dignity and my decency. So I gave that up a while back. So I'm not afraid of rolling on the floor, clucking like a chicken, barking like whatever. However God wants to touch me, I'm all in. I'm available. I told him, Lord, if I have to lose my job because I fall out in the middle of my class, so be it. I'd rather not miss out on any move of your spirit. So just that's where I'm coming from with all these. Barak means to kneel down, to bless God as an act of adoration. The next one, Zamar. This one's one of my favorites. It means to touch the strings of an instrument. Zach was doing some sweet Zamar this morning, getting way up there in like the 15th fret. I don't even know what notes are up there. I got no clue, but it sounded great. This is kind of like the, the praise that David used when Saul was demonized, and he came in and played his guitar, his lyre, and the demons left. So these are really cool sometimes when there's a Selah moment in church, and there's a space there. It's okay that there's space. It doesn't have to be filled. Like you can, you can sit there and let whoever is prophesying with their instrument minister over you, and you'll be surprised what kind of things break off of you. It's really awesome. And then the last one's my favorite. It's tahila. And it's derived from the word halal. It means singing of halals. To sing or to laud, perceived to involve music, especially singing hymns of the spirit of praise. It is an unrehearsed or spontaneous song that erupts from the heart. So you can tahila all the time. John tahilas while he's cleaning toilets. It's pretty cool. What I love about this one is this is the tahila in Psalm 22, verse 3, where it says, excuse me, you are holy, you who are enthroned upon the praises, tahila praises of Israel. <laughs> so when we lift up a spontaneous song that we didn't practice, you know, you just start singing whatever melodies on your heart. Oh, Lord, you're wonderful. You're marvelous. We praise you for your healing. We praise you for your glory. That's a spontaneous song. And when that begins to erupt from your heart, or you can, in tongues or in your understanding, that's the praise that God's presence is enthroned on. The word enthroned basically means to have authority. So he's already here, he's already sitting on the throne, but when we lift up spontaneous praise, there's things that the enemy has control of where he's enthroned, or things that we have in control of where we've been enthroned that are given over to him. And he begins to invade the space and take authority. He starts running the show which is really fun. It's also the same one in Isaiah 61, 3, to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of Tehillah praise instead of the spirit of fainting. So they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. So you want to be an oak of righteousness? Just lift up that spontaneous song to the Lord. Super cool. We enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. We offer a sacrifice. With thanksgiving and praise, it's a sacrifice. You know, we, there's lots of psalms that talk about the sacrifice of thanksgiving. But how do we enter the inner places? If we're entering the courts with thanksgiving, the gates with praise, how do we get into the holy of holies? And I believe that that's where worship comes in. In worship, in contrast to thanksgiving and praise, we are the sacrifice. So thanksgiving can be a sacrifice, praise can be a sacrifice, but in the place of worship, we are the sacrifice. Romans 12 verse 1, Beloved friends, what should our proper response to God's marvelous mercies? To surrender yourselves to God to be his sacred living sacrifices and live in holiness, experiencing all that delights his heart. 
for this becomes your genuine expression of worship. That's how we worship. See, in Thanksgiving, we might offer a song or a dance. In praise, we might offer this song about who he is and prophesy through waving flags or dancing around, jumping up and down. But in worship, we live as the sacrifice. We become that sacrifice. You can enter a worship service without ever interacting with God personally. So you can give thanks and shout praise without ever coming face to face with Jesus. It's like going to a great party and you never interact with the host. Like, let's say BK and Heather are throwing this awesome party. And they invite me, because why wouldn't they? Of course they would. And they've got, like, the, the fire breathers going on. They've got a Brazilian steakhouse thing going on. You just flip the card, and it's green. I've never been there. I've just heard stories about it. It's, it's on my bucket list. That's why I'm so glad it says taste and see that the Lord is good, you know? Not just see that the Lord is good. That's like going to the zoo. Oh, there's God. But he says taste and see, which means they throw you in the lion's den with him, you know? You get to experience the goodness of God. Anyway, so BK's got this party going, and, and hope, oh, we're all invited, and we're all dancing, we're all having a good time, we're eating food, we're interacting with each other, and the night comes to a close, and we all leave, and I realize that I never even spoke to BK. That's sometimes what we do in a worship service on a Sunday morning. So we show up, we sing the songs, we dance, we shout, we praise, we prophesy, we minister to each other, and we leave having never encountered Jesus face to face. And that's not a shameful thing. I think it's very rare when we get genuine worship experiences with God, and when they happen, we should stay there and savor them to the fullest extent. I want to talk about the word presence. In, in the Hebrew and the Greek, both words in Old Testament and New Testament, the word for presence actually also means face. So when we're interacting with his presence, he's always present. But when his manifest presence, manifest just means obvious, comes and invades the room like it did this morning, that's us interacting with him face to face. That's our opportunity. That doesn't happen all the time. Like sometimes even when you sit down for an hour with the Lord, that sweet presence isn't there. It's not a guarantee. See, if it was a guarantee, then like if God just showed up every Sunday with his full glory and his full presence, worship would be involuntary. We would all hit the floor. Whether or not we wanted to, whether or not we're saved, whether or not we love Jesus, if he showed up in power, in the fullness of who he is every time, if he walked through the wall in his glorified body, our worship would happen whether we want it to or not. We would all hit the floor. <laughs> so there's a reason why it doesn't happen every time, because worship needs to be a choice. He wants us to make the conscious decision to worship him. See, I, I've talked to people that are like, well... I don't want to give a fake offering to the Lord. That's why I don't stand. That's why I don't lift my hands. That's why I don't sing or shout or dance or any of those things. And I'm not trying to shame anybody for the way that you worship God. You worship him how you worship him. I, you don't worship him how I worship him. There's a, there's a way he's designed you that he hasn't designed me. So that's not where I'm coming across. But that type of thinking is flawed inerrantly because that's actually false worship if you have to feel it first. Like, if you've got to be worked up into worshiping God, you're really not worshiping God. <laughs> you're interacting with my worship with God. See, you can, just like Moses came down off the mountain with the glory on his face, people can interact with Moses' face and the glory on it. That is not Jesus' face. It's Jesus' glory, but it's not his face that they're interacting with. So I encourage you, even when you don't feel it, make a choice to shout, to sing, to dance, to praise, especially when you don't feel it. Because 
Usually when you don't feel it, you know, this is extra biblical. This is just me speaking, so if you want to rebuke me later, that's fine. But they talk about Satan being the prince and the power of the air. I believe he literally has, like, a kingdom, like, like a place that he lives in the air, in, the, in those heavens, in between us and heaven. And when we don't feel it, the way I see it in my head is he's just got some really thick carpet right there. And my praise is like an M80 blasting through his floorboards. So especially when I don't feel it, I think the aroma that comes before the Lord is especially sweet. When he knows that I'm making a decision, where I'm making a sacrifice to praise him when I don't feel it. Anyway, I think you get the point. The presence of God means face. It infers his glory, his favor, his joy. So those words could be interchanged. Whenever you see the word presence, you could say face. Or you could say his favor. Or you could say his glory. In fact, the glory of God is the face of Jesus. So when we're asking him to show us his glory, it is the face of Jesus. That's what we're asking for. Let's look at the word worship. There's two words, two main words for worship. In the Old Testament, they used the word shaka. It's a fun word to say. And it means to bow, specifically to bow so low that your head is below your heart. <laughs> I think that's really cool. That the word for worship means to bow so low that your heart is what's on top. It's like flipping you upside down. Upside down kingdom. But the Greek word for worship, proskuneo, I don't know if I said that right. Sorry if I didn't. Means to kiss. <laughs> and a lot, of peop- a lot of scholars believe that that Greek word actually came from the a description of the action of a dog licking its master's hand. So when we kiss, it's like we're kissing the hand of Jesus, kissing the face of Jesus. I was getting wrecked last night thinking about this because the Holy Spirit said to me, imagine how much it hurt when Judas kissed me to betray me. And I was like, oh, Lord, I'm so sorry that that happened to you. Like, I am so sorry that someone abused their worship to you in order to make money. And that's a lesson for worship leaders like me because there's a lot of money to be made. But I don't ever want to abuse my worship before God so that I can make money and betray him. Anyway, that was not in the notes. So let's go back now to John chapter 4. Now we're going to look at verse 24. So the next one. We just read 23 at the beginning. 24, God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So what does that mean? When we're walking in the spirit... Worshiping in spirit basically just means walking in the spirit. Hand in hand with the Holy Spirit, he's leading us, he's helping us to worship God. He's stirring things up, he's guiding us, he's giving us cool ideas. Hey, wouldn't it be cool if you like did a backflip? Oh, that would be cool. Thanks, Holy Spirit. I'm going to try it. (laughs) You know, we'll see if anybody tries that. It means to be led and hand by hand, hand in hand with the Holy Spirit. What's really cool, when you look back in the Garden of Eden, when Adam walked with God in the cool of the day, the word for cool is ruah, which means spirit. So when it's talking about Adam walking in the cool of the day, it's talking about him walking in the spirit. So that's how we can worship. It's just walking with God as we worship him. But worshiping him in truth, truth basically means there's nothing hidden. Everything is exposed. Nothing's off limits. That's scary. Scary. So when we worship with spirit and truth, we're worshiping hand in hand with him where he gets full access. Honesty. Hey God, here I am again in the face of temptation and I really want to sin. Help. I just invite you into this place where I'm struggling, where I'm weak, and I want to lean on your strength. That's truth. That's being honest with God. You can't lie to God anyway, but we still try all the time, just like we try to lie to ourselves. This is like Psalm 139, 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious hearts, 
and see if there be any hurtful way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. When we truly worship, we bring our heart to a place of prominence and importance. Our head is below our heart. We bow. We open our hearts in truth and sincerity, nothing hidden from God, withholding nothing from him. And then we kiss the face or the hand of Jesus, meaning that we extend our adoration and our heart's affections toward him face to face. We seek him privately and we open our heart's desires to him and we allow him to see us. I love, my sister says, intimacy basically means into me you see. It's a great way. Okay, I'm, I'm wrapping up here. I hope this has been helpful. I want to talk about one last thing, and this is Mary's alabaster jar. Now, there's four accounts. There's probably, if you really look into it, there's probably three different occurrences listed in Scripture of Jesus being anointed. There's one that's in Matthew and Mark. There's one that's in Luke, and there's one that's in John. The one in John is is Mary of Bethany. The other ones were women that we don't know. One of them was a sinful woman, and one of them was just an unnamed woman. In all three of them, they were shamed. And in one of them, Jesus was shamed for this act of worship. I'm going to read it out of John 12 in the Passion Translation. Six days before the Passover began, Jesus went back to Bethany, the town where he raised Lazarus from the dead. They had prepared a supper, a supper for Jesus. Martha served, and Lazarus and Mary were among those at the table. Sorry. Mary picked up an alabaster jar filled with nearly a liter of extremely rare and costly perfume, the purest extract of nard, and she anointed Jesus' feet. Then she wiped them dry with her long hair, and the fragrance of the costly oil filled the house. But Judas the locksmith Simon's son, the betrayer, spoke up and said, What a waste. We could have sold this perfume for a fortune and given the money to the poor. In fact, Judas had no heart for the poor. He only said this because he was a thief and in charge of the money case. He would steal money whenever he wanted from the funds given to support Jesus' ministry. And Jesus said to Judas, Leave her alone. She has saved it for the time of my burial. You'll always have the poor with you but you won't always have me. Judas comes in, what a waste. 24-7 prayer, what a waste. Why don't you guys just pray at home? Why don't you use those resources for something else that's useful instead of just showing up and praying? You want to be an intercessory missionary? What a waste. I'm not going to give money to that. Why don't you go preach the gospel? You want to You want to have a a worship service where all we do is just encounter God? What a waste. You know, Judas was shaming her worship because he didn't understand the cost. See, that's the first thing that I think is really important, is that this cost her something. In fact, this anointing oil could have been her inheritance. It could have been the family's treasure. That's how valuable it was. I mean, it was over a year's worth of wages. Now, I'm a teacher, so my wages are much less than most people's. But they're still pretty substantial. And me wasting a year's wages at the feet of Jesus would be something. And I guarantee you, a lot of people would have a problem with it. If I had a briefcase filled with 40 grand in it, and I just brought it up to the altar and lit it on fire... Most people would have a problem with that. But if it was done out of worship to God, given to him, then no one has the right to, have, to be offended. It costs her something. Worship always costs something. True worship. The second thing I want to point out is this was not a huge public setting, but a small, intimate gathering of Jesus' close companions. The sacrifice was made in a small room, and it filled that room. It said the fragrance filled the room. And actually, only in this account does it say that. It doesn't say that about the other ones. But in Mary's, 
worship. The fragrance filled the room. And it wasn't a big room. It was just a couple friends. Just Mary and her brother and sister and some of the disciples. And it filled a small room, but it resounded for eternity. Your small worship, when it costs you something, when it's in the secret place, when you sit down with your binder of songs and you say, these are yours, and nobody sees it, that resounds for eternity. When you take your kids and you dedicate them, you say, you know what, Lord? This one is for you. That resounds for eternity. It seems insignificant. But when you give something that you don't have to give out of love and adoration, that resounds for eternity. And it might fill the small room where you're at, but it will show up in place after place after place, out in public, in your families, in generations after you, your small sacrifice of worship shows up. That's how important it is to God. The last thing I want to point out is that when Mary anointed Jesus with her alabaster jar, she then wiped his feet with her hair. The scent filled the house. But when they all left, there were two people that smelled like that fragrance. Nobody else did. There were two people. See, God doesn't share his glory with any man. But when we come and we break ourselves at his feet, we get our head above our heart, other way around, and we kiss his feet, we kiss his hand, we kiss his face, we do something that costs us, something embarrassing, something that people revile and make fun of you for, you leave that place and you smell just like he does. Your worship doesn't just anoint him. It anoints you too. Nobody else smelled like they did. When we break open our hearts and make a costly sacrifice, we leave smeared in the glory of the Lord. So I want to remind you back when we talked about the temple service. We go in, we minister to God. We turn around, we minister to people. We serve people well. We love people well. And those two things qualify you for the other thing. You serve people well, it qualifies you for a deeper level of intimacy with the Lord. You serve God well, and it qualifies you for a deeper level of breakthrough in public. He can trust you. And you start to smell like him. You start to look like him. That glory that was on Moses' face is the same glory that gets on your face. Because God doesn't share his glory with anyone but it gets on everything that he touches. All of it. Would you pray with me? Father, we do not want to be like the Levites and the priests who worshiped with the wrong intentions. God, we don't want to praise you so that you will be enthroned. We want to praise you because you're worthy. We don't want to worship you because of what we get out of it. We want to worship you because we love you. God, I lift up my friends to you. I lift up this family to you. God, I ask that you would show us how to worship in spirit and truth. God, I ask that you would send people from this place smeared with their offering, smelling like you, looking like you, thinking the way you do. But God, would you remind them when they're at home by themselves, hey, this is a great time to break a jar. Would you make us a people who pursue you privately 
for no reason other than our love for you, our devotion to you. Help us, give us grace to put our heads below our hearts and to worship you rightly. We just want to move your heart, God. That's all we want to do. We just want to move your heart. We just want to move your heart. Yes, God. such a rich rich grace upon upon us right now. You know, it's as though the the Lord comes to to seal his his presence over us, his face in our soul. Thank you, Lord. Lord, may we never lose what we see in your beauty. The world's pretty ugly. (laughs) But that's not all there is. We praise you, Father, for opening up to us, giving us eyes to see the beauty of who you are. Anoint us afresh. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So good. It's been a good series. We've been doing the heart, the heartbeat series of just. Uh, it's not us exclusively, but you know, as a church, who we are. This is these are things that are valuable to us that we we see as um, things that God's called us to, and uh, we've been going through those from week to week. What a great job, Josh. Thank you so much. Thank you. So good. And uh, so, hey, it's, it's not just what we do, it's who we are. And uh, because that's true, maybe, maybe as we close, if anybody wants to just come and spend some time before him at the altar, we're just going to close in such a way, take our fellowship out, to the back but if anybody would like to come forward and just spend some time before him um, this is a great time to do that thank you Lord Father today we leave with the fragrance of Christ upon us (laughs) Lord thank you Lord for this interaction today for the beauty of Christ thank you Lord for what you have not only taught us, but you have taught to our hearts, not just our minds. And we go with that, Father. Seal it over us. Seal it in us. And bring it forth. Call it out uh, in deeper realm. Deep calls to deep. Thank you, Father. Lord, we commit ourselves to you. Let us be a light into this world, a city on a hill. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Love you guys. Be blessed. Have a great Sunday. And we'll see you next week. If we don't see you Wednesday night, been having a great time in our equipping group. God bless.